The other really good news is that we have Bud Martin with us this morning. Uh, Bud had quite an adventure last week. <clears throat> and um, for those who don't believe in miracles, ask Bud, uh, the medical profession, um, and did their magic and solved his issues, and he's with us this morning. So, Bud, we're thrilled that you're here with us. Um, the other bad news is, um, it's, it's almost like COVID around here. Um, I, I learned Thursday, I think it was Thursday from Nora Lee, that um, Joe was taken to the hospital with chest pains. Had the exact same procedure that Bud did. <clears throat> and is still in the hospital. I spoke with Nora Lee this morning. He's doing well. They both had COVID on top of all this. Um, He's doing well. He's not happy, but whoever is happy in the hospital, but he's, he's, in much, he's improved and expects to go home, I think, tomorrow. So please keep Bud's continued recovery and Joe and Nora Lee in our prayers. Um, Pat, you have something you wanted to share with us. <clears throat> From 12 to 4 today. Can you hear me? Okay. Does this work? Okay. Saying I didn't find out about this soon enough for our, class, our church to participate, but um, Frank Pintabone, who's one of the um, people on, our, on the council, town council, every year around this time of the year has what they call a back to school rally. I didn't know this, maybe some of you did. But it's today from 12 to 4, downtown in Scott Park. And they give away free book bags and supplies, free haircuts, free manicures. The high school drum line's gonna be there. Uh, and there are tables set up by various churches and so forth to give away things that the kids need for school. I think it's fabulous and I, I hope that we'll participate. But this year we can't participate, but we can certainly visit. So I was excited to let you know about that. And the other thing, of course, is that Breaking Bread, my, our, our faithful Breaking Bread people, we have a meeting. Go downstairs, get some coffee, get a cookie, and we'll have a little meeting, not very long, to set up for the next Breaking Bread. Oh, this week's brunch mode. Sorry, it's next week. Okay, that's fine. I messed that up. Yeah, it's next week. Okay, thank you. Okay, brunch bunch today, as we've just noted. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the announcements, full two pages, always good news. Um, Third Street Alliance, they're not in, moving in yet, um, but we, we expect, you know, they're still sorting out wrinkles, we're still wrestling with uh, language on the lease, um, but it's moving ahead, so it's, it's just a matter of time, probably in the next week or two. Um, Breaking bread and on save the date, coffee hour after church. Um, blessing box. You don't need to bring food. There's food in the pantry. There's instructions here in the back. Finally, lots of reminders, lots going on, meetings coming up. We're busy and active. So, with all that said, let's greet each other. I'll wave. And passing, passing to passing a peace, Jesus Christ. Peace be with you all. Ahem. <clears throat>
Let me add a, a couple quick more words before we begin worship. Um, Shirley asked me, uh, Joe's in Muhlenberg. Um, I would, I'd give Norley a call first, but if you want to visit, that's where he is. Secondly, uh, we received another $500 towards our air conditioners, another anonymous gift, which takes us to $18,500. Praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Please rise and join me in a responsive reading of the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. The Lord's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let the earth exalt his name altogether. I sought the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to the Lord and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. O oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in the Lord. Come, let us worship God. Please join me in a reading of the prayer of confession. Glorious things of you are truly spoken. O Lord, giver of grace, which never fails from age to age. Yet we confess this morning that there are moments when we struggle 
as we wander through the wilderness that seems ever-present. At times, loneliness permeates our days, and we wonder if you are near. Perhaps a recent failure or significant loss in our lives leaves us feeling hopeless, and the evening news only seems to stoke our concerns for the world and our fears for a brighter tomorrow. Lord, as with Elijah, send your spirit to touch each of us and assure us that you, O Lord, are always a constant and affirming presence in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, despite the trials of our days, the uncertainties of tomorrow, know that the Lord is our God and our companion, and that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forever the Lord's redeemed people. Thanks be to God. seated. A couple of you came in late, so let me explain why I'm keeping my distance. I'm not normally a shy person. Um, Angie tested positive, positive for COVID. I'm fine so far, but I want to keep my distance, so that's why I'm up here and you're there. <laughs> We're going to leave it that way. And Caitlin, my dear, I'd nothing more than have you come up and help me this morning, but um, I'll have to try to do it by myself. Without you, I hope I don't screw it up. Anyhow, here it goes. What's in the old bag today? Well, let's see. Our uh, scripture talks a little bit about wilderness this morning. And uh, so I was rummaging around to see what I had. <clears throat> if I were in the wilderness, and by golly, you know what I found? My old swift army knife. What a great tool for being in the wilderness. I mean, it's got a little bit of everything in it, doesn't it? I mean, well... Well, we count as a can opener. Now, there's something you need in the wilderness. And what else do we have here? Um, oh, it's a Phillips head screwdriver. Well, I'm not sure what you'd use that in the wilderness for, but who knows, right? Um, what else do we have here? Oh, looky here, magnifying glass. Now, you know, if you were studying something, that would be handy. I'm not sure why, but it would be. Uh, what else is in this thing? Um, oh, a pair of scissors. I don't know. You might need them in a the wilderness, whatever. Oh, and then finally, well, there's more in here, but we go on all morning with this darn thing. Mm. A corkscrew, just in case you found a bottle of vintage bottle of wine while you're <laughs> drifting along in the weeds. Anyhow, so that would be a handy thing in the wilderness, but even more handy if you're in the wilderness. Now, listen, you're going to have to use your imaginations. You're all young folk here. You all can think broadly. If you were in the wilderness, all by yourself, and let's say you've been there for a week, maybe two weeks, and out of the heavens comes a parachute, right? Kind of. Attached to it is some food, some nourishment. Oh, well. <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> Sometimes we're in our own little personal wilderness, not out in the weeds and out in the frickets, but kind of in a funk. Um, we need to look to the heavens and look for that manna to come down, that manna in the presence of God, kind of put his arms around us and nourish us and make us feel better and help us understand that, well, a little dim today, bright sunshine coming out tomorrow, 
Believe in that manna. Pray for that manna. It'll find you. If it doesn't come down in a parachute, though, but it'll find you. God bless you all. The Old Testament lesson for today comes to us from Kings. In this morning's reading, the prophet Elijah, second only to Moses in the esteem of the Hebrew people, is in a funk. He has just, at God's command, virtually eliminated the priests of Baal, much to the extreme displeasure of Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. Jezebel, in a rage, threatens to kill Elijah, so he flees to the wilderness to escape her wrath and perhaps life altogether. Hear now the word of God. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. The New Testament reading for today is from John. The pericope this morning follows from last Sunday. Jesus continues to speak to the crowds that trail him after he has fed them with five loaves and two fish and attempts to explain to them that he, Jesus, rather than a provider of physical nourishment, is the bread of life come from heaven. This comment provokes the crowds to wonder just who Jesus really thinks that he is. Hear now the word of God. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> the hump. The hump. The hump was the nickname for the aerial route over the Himalayas from northeast India to southwest China, which was a vital in delivering supplies to the Allied forces during World War II. It was an arduous journey with dangers as grave as any front during the war. Unlike, for instance, the bombing missions in Germany, the threats to the pilots <clears throat> flying the hump weren't fighter aircraft or enemy anti-aircraft fire, but the elements, the elements, the weather in the mountains. Winds of 40 to 70 mile an hour were not uncommon in clear weather they would be flying at 12 to 14,000 feet in unpressurized aircraft 
Yet they were within seeing distance of mountains 17,000 feet. The weather, however, was seldom clear. Frequent thunderstorms and the persistent monsoon rains typified the flying environment, often resulting in very heavy icing conditions. And if the mountains and the weather didn't get them, the jungle often did. Bailing out of uncontrollable aircraft was a common and frequent risk. And if making it safely to the jungle floor, there were lurking blood-sucking leeches, venomous snakes constantly underfoot, as well as large predators, wild boar, tigers, water buffalo, and elephants. And this was the kind of wilderness that countless pilots and crew confronted with a rescue during the early years of the war, usually impossible. Such are the conditions that American pilots flying the hump as were, are, are vividly described in a recent book by Caroline Alexander, Skies of Thunder, the Deadly World War II Mission Over the Roof of the, <coughs> over the, roof of the World. So as a, as a pilot, it makes for riveting reading and jaw-dropping awe for those who took on that mission. In time, both the Americans and the British commanders began to develop and successfully execute rescue missions of downed aircrew. The missions themselves often required heroic flying, followed by weeks of trekking through the forbidding jungle toward the downed airmen. Just locating the down air crews was a daunting exercise in of itself. And having found them, one of the first actions was, well, airdrop food and medical supplies from time to time, and from time to time, airdrop a very courageous flight surgeon. I can only remotely imagine how those air crewmen felt after days or weeks in the thick, dark, dank, dangerous jungle, they witnessed parachutes laden with life's necessities floating toward them literally from the heavens. Salvation in a parachute and a chance at survival. Rescue, rescue from the wilderness. This morning, our friend the prophet Elijah finds himself in the wilderness as well. While he's not suffering in the humidity and the horror of the Burmese jungle, he does find himself in a very arid land and seeks shelter, according to the text, under a solitary broom tree. Word about a broom tree. Actually, it's not a tree at all. It's a shrub. A shrub that grows across arid Arabia and the Judean wilderness. And it's, the only, it's not the only time that this is mentioned, this broom tree is mentioned in the Bible. Job describes the broom tree as a place of desolation, ruin, disappointment. And the psalmist connects the broom tree with mourning, distress, and punishment. So it seems quite appropriate that we find Elijah sitting hopelessly under a broom tree asking the Lord, to take his life. So why the hopelessness and despair, the desperate attempt at suicide using God as the weapon? As Amy told us earlier, Elijah has literally wiped out, physically wiped out the priests of Baal, only to encounter the, the wrath of Jezebel, wife of the king, Ahab. And Jezebel has now sent out assassins to do the work that, well, Elijah is now sitting there asking God to do, to end his life. Elijah feels that he has failed at his vocation as a prophet of the Lord. Rather than considering himself a victor over the priests of Baal, he sees himself as a failure and asks God to terminate, from his perspective, his worthless life. Much as a battle-worn soldier, Elijah seems to be suffering an early version of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
cannot visualize a future for himself, then, as is now, the violence encountered on a battlefield wrecks havoc, even with so-called winners. But all was not lost with Elijah in the wilderness sitting under the broom tree. Just as, well, all was not lost for the hump flyers who found themselves lost and suffering in the jungles of Burma. For out of the heavens, rather than life-giving food dangling from the strings of a parachute, came cake and water delivered by an angel. Now, who sends angels, right? God sends an angel down to Elijah, who commanded Elijah to get up and eat. So Elijah gets up. He eats, he drinks, lies down again. Not being deterred, God sends a second angel, again encouraging Elijah to get up and eat. And so he does, and with renewed strength and vigor, finds the ability to march on for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. Now that's where Moses encountered God, coincidentally enough. Well, not exactly manna from heaven, this sequence presents the opportunity for God's people to once again reflect on their own experiences of wandering and redemption. Wandering redemption in the physical wilderness or wilderness of their own creation. This tale of suffering, despair, redemption anticipates for us the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus in the wilderness, who, according to Mark, writes, Jesus was with the wild beasts waited upon by angels. For Elijah, perhaps for us, the wilderness is a place of giving and receiving, of weakness and despair, but hopefully, hopefully, an occasion of spiritual strengthening and vocational renewal. Do you recall the boy or perhaps the girl down the street? We most likely all knew one, perhaps a little on the chunky, chubby side, not particularly outstanding in appearance. As far as, well, being athletic when the only game in town was the Little League, this boy down the street couldn't hit the ocean with a baseball if he was standing on the beach. As for academics, eh, no scholar, no whiz in science or mathematics. And when he played his saxophone, it more resembled a, a, a flock of geese headed south rather than, say, Stan Getz of soft jazz fame. Nope. The boy down the street was, well, pretty easy to dismiss, <laughs> if not to totally ignore. In fact, in fact, he was best known not for himself, but as the kid of a gifted and talented father and a mother of compassion and serenity. Time passes. And the kid down the street who all thought was headed for a boring and mediocre life at best now has a PhD in ecology, a particular expertise in forestry. He's a full professor at an esteemed university. He's written 25 books on recovery of woodlands. He has been a personal advisor to presidents and others on issues of recovering and <clears throat> preserving precious woodlands and tropical forests. The boy down the street. Well, who knew? Who knew? John tells us this morning about the boy down the street. Jesus, after having fed 5,000, is now trying to tell them, that same crowd that followed him, that there exists nourishing and redemptive bread other than that which comes from someone's oven. In fact, that he, Jesus, is the bread of life of which he speaks. Now, the members of the crowd who are looking for another meal of physical bread, 
look at each other and essentially say, Jesus, isn't he the boy down the street? Isn't he the kid of Joseph and Mary? You remember Joseph? Golly, Joseph, he could create anything out of wood. What a craftsman. And his wife, Mary, oh my goodness, such a wonderful, compassionate, giving woman. But Jesus, the boy down the street, he was never the craftsman his father was. I mean, he couldn't drive a nail straight if his life depended on it. Now he's trying to tell us, convince us, that he, Jesus, the kid down the block, is the bread that came from heaven? <laughs> you, you've got to be kidding. Well, I don't know about you, but, but I can kind of understand the skeptics in this audience, can't you? Jesus tells them that he, much like the angel coming to Elijah, was life-giving bread. Something similar, perhaps, to the parachutes descending from the heavens, laden with food for those stranded airmen. That Jesus is the bread of life coming down from heaven. Well, I mean, it kind of seems understandable that those ascended, assembled rather in Capernaum might have had a hard time at first swallowing those words of Jesus. However, however, two words repeatedly used by Jesus as he addressed the crowds ring out to me and I suspect rang out to those assembled Jews. I am. I am. Four times in his pericope, Jesus says, I am. I am the bread of life. I am. The same two words that God uses in conversation with Moses on Mount Sinai, is it not? In the wilderness journey from Egypt to the promised land. Moses asked God what he should call God when the Israelites ask Moses what's God's name. And God responded, I am. I am. Tell the Israelites that I am has sent you, Moses, to them. This is my name. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. I am. I am was not totally lost on those Jewish crowds who knew their Old Testament Bible listening to Jesus. Nor, nor were they, I think, used by Jesus without understanding their impact. Jesus responds to their skepticism and taunts with patience and also by revealing something quite startling to their ears. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I, I will raise that person up on the last day. Two things here. First, Jesus tells the crowds and us that the opportunity to fully know him, that completely grasp who Jesus is, other than a boy down the street, that's a divine gift from God. That's a gift from God. We can work all we want to at trying to come to know Jesus, but in the end, that knowledge is a revelation from God. And they shall be taught by the Father, Jesus tells them. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Our comprehension and understanding of Christ is a gift. A gift from heaven. Secondly, Jesus, well, initially in his readings from John in, verse, in uh, chapter 6, a little kind of... You wonder where he's going with all this. He finally, I think, begins to make clear just what the bread of life represents. Whoever believes has eternal life, he tells them. I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of heaven. 
Not sustenance for earthly mortality, but sustenance for eternity. How do we know this? Jesus tells us in verse 41, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. That came down from heaven. Standing before the skeptical crowds at Capernaum, believing that they are confronting the boy from down the street, is the eternal word made flesh. The fullness of God. If they and us ever wondered what God looks like, what God acts like, what God talks like, <laughs> well, frankly, <laughs> it's like the boy from down the street. Because now there he stands in front of them, in front of us, in the fullness of God. I don't know about you, but I kind of like my heroes humble, but I like my God gigantic, high, lifted up, distant, exclusively in heaven, not like the boy from down the street. I kind of like my God to be like the one in Isaiah, Isaiah writes, the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. I love that image. Uh, Isaiah also says, the Lord who has measured out the waters in a hollow of his hand, marked off the heavens with a span. <laughs> yeah, here we are. From the Jesus perspective, with a boy from down the street, right? God in the flesh. Standing before them and us, I am the bread of life. Feed upon me. Can it be true that Jesus is the bread we need? even if Jesus is rarely the bread that we seek? Is it true that God has come down to us from the heavens as bread? As with the angel feeding Elijah under the broom tree, as with the parachutes feeding the desperate airmen in the jungle with life-sustaining food, but this food, this bread, this bread from heaven, sustains more than life. This manna dropped miraculously from heaven into our personal wilderness, taken fully into ourselves. We become survivors. We become survivors, not just for tomorrow or next week or next year. We become survivors for an eternity. Praise the Lord.
I travel through the wilderness so far away from home. Though dangers surround me, My beacon and guide, my strength and my song, and I will be strong. I will walk unafraid with the Lord as my companion every step. in my heart because I know he is with me everywhere I go. This is my journey, like Israel of old. I need not wander lost, nor seek to find my way alone. His presence before me is all that I require. The Lord is my light, my beacon and guide, my pillar of fire, and I will be strong. I will walk on a every step along the way then come what may i'll live with courage in my heart because i know he is my with me everywhere i go This is my journey, and nothing will I fear. The Lord my God will safely comfort me and keep me that way sure, my help and my guardian to the journey. The Lord is my light, my beacon and guide, my savior and friend, and I will be strong, I will walk unafraid, with the Lord as my companion, every step along the way. Then come what may I'll fear with courage in my heart because I know He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is my perfect light of truth. And he will be with me everywhere I go.
Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Gloria, thank you. It's kind of like a wilderness out there. It feels that way to me sometimes, but you know, that's what happens when you get old and things move on ahead of you. Um, we have really two principal jobs here. Help people lost in that wilderness to find a bread of life and to serve those people who are lost in a wilderness. You folks work awful hard at that, let me tell you. But we can't continue that, both those important missions <clears throat> without the generous contributions of all of us gathered here. So please, to support the ministry of this church, your collection in any of the boxes in the front of the rear of the church, a check in the mail electronically, however you wish to support the ministry here at First Presbyterian of Easton. Now please join me in a prayer dedication found in the bulletin. Gracious Father, our offering seems all too small in relationship to the blessings from your heart and the grace that is provided to us through the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Yet we make these offerings in your name and dedicate them toward furthering your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Please be seated and, and join me uh, in a few words of prayer. Oh Lord, we gave, we give up our thanksgivings, we shout hallelujah, and we praise your name. For the manna descended from heaven for the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and, and for the salvation that comes to us from his sacrifice. We give thanks, Lord, for the persistent and everlasting call to us from you, our God, through the Holy Spirit, beckoning us, pleading with us to come to fully know our Lord through Jesus Christ. Lord, we give thanksgiving for the miracles in our lives. Miracles in our lives is witnessed by the life-sustaining procedures performed for both Bud and Joe. We give thanks for the expertise and dedication of all those in our medical professions. And Lord, we offer up specific prayers. We not only give thanks, but we continue to pray for Bud and Joe as they fully recover. For all, Lord, we pray for all we know who are suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually. We pray for, for healing. We pray for wholeness. We pray for all those, Lord, who are lost in their own personal wilderness, who find themselves in despair or hopelessness over any number of painful situations and challenges. May they find hope. May they find guidance. May they find comfort in your presence. We pray, Lord, for all those in the world who suffer from hunger, who suffer from violence and disease. May they find nourishment. May they find healing. And may they enjoy peace. 
And Lord, we pray for this congregation as it strives to serve our community in your name. Now please join me as we say together that wonderful prayer that Jesus taught the disciples and they who in turn taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to scoot out after the benediction. 
So I pray you all have a good week. Um, if you need to reach me, by all means, give me a call, text me, email, I'll respond. I plan to be here Tuesday on my regular day. So I think we all find ourselves in a wilderness. I don't know when you find your wilderness. My wilderness usually arrives around 2 a.m. in the morning. I wake up, and all the challenges that it seem to be facing me are looming, like Frankenstein coming out of the closet or whatever ugly things I can think of. So when I find myself in that wilderness, wandering around, scared, I start to recite the Lord's Prayer. And I do that over and over and over again until I find peace and all those wilderness critters go away. That's the bread of life, thankfully coming down giving me comfort, giving me peace. I pray you feel that same bread of life in your lives as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the peace and grace of the Lord be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Enjoy coffee hour. Enjoy brunch bunch. Have a great week.